nicely summarized by the hymn that we just sang. Because Christ has lived for us, now Christ lives in us. And, and, and what does he motivate? He motivates love in our lives. We'll be using the common service as you'll find it in your bulletin or on the screen in front of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my
full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is Psalm 98. We'll sing the refrain at the beginning, and at the end it will speak the verses responsibly. you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, 
fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, the one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came out from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
the gospel comes from, from Jesus' words and, and is really the, the summary of the Ten Commandments, if you remember from catechism class. Um, what is that one word summary of the, of the Ten Commandments? It's not obey, it's love. If you really love the way that Jesus has called us to love, then you'll obey by keeping the commandments, if you love. And this is Jesus' words. This is Jesus' command, as he says in the last verse. This is my command, love each other. This is God's word. May we always learn and benefit from this word of God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, in the book, The River Kwai, The Bridge Over the River Kwai, it's been made into a, a, a good movie. I think it was one of the best movies in the year that it was made. Not made for Academy Awards back in the late 1950s. But it's a book, and I'm not sure exactly how historical it is, but it's based on historical events. It tells the story of, of a bunch of Scottish prisoner of war captives. They, they had been captured by, by the opposite side. They had been put into these POW camps in the, in the little islands of, of, of Burma and Thailand, these thickly, densely, not <clears throat> populated with people, but with just trees. And, and, and to keep them busy and to help the enemy accomplish something that it had never been able to do, they, they sent these prisoners of war to work by constructing a railroad through the, the jungles. Ter terrible work. <clears throat> not, not only was the work terrible every single day, but the treatment was terrible, as, as you can see from the pictures that come out of World War II. These people were, were treated the same way as the people were in Germany who were in the prisoner of war camps, to the point that when they were treated and mistreated so cruelly and so inhumanely, they started kind of using that as their baseline and how they treated each other. So even though they were soldiers on the same team, on the same side, because they had been treated so terribly, they started to treat each other terribly. To the point that there were stories of, of somebody drops a, a scrap of food on the ground and you've got a bunch of soldiers, almost like dogs, trying to pick up a little scrap of food so they can get a little bit more in their stomachs. One day, when they were working out in the middle of the jungle, chopping down trees, laying down lines for this railroad, there was a count done, as they always did a couple times during the day. And they were trying to make sure that no tools were stolen to take back to the camp and, and maybe use for weapons. So they always had these tool checks. One day, the Japanese commander, he says, it's tool check time. And, and they came up one shovel short. So he gathered everybody together, they lined up in rows, and he says, somebody has to step forward. Otherwise, somebody's going to die. And everybody was completely silent. Nobody stepped forward. Nobody said a word. And the Japanese commander started getting more and more upset. He started running around and saying, all will die. All will die if nobody produces this shovel. And right when you think he is going to start shooting all these prisoners of war because they did produce this missing shovel, one man, one prisoner of war steps forward, takes the blame. The Japanese commander takes a shovel and beats the prisoner of war to death and then just leaves him, leaves him lay there. They keep on working for the rest of the day and then they have another tool check at the end of the day. When they counted the right number of shovels, they went back and they said, you must have miscounted because we were one short. They counted again and they found out, no, we have the right number of shovels. What had happened was that there was a miscount earlier in the day. And one person died for nothing. At least it was thought. And when that word was found out, that word spread like a wildfire throughout the whole prisoner of war camp. And, and people were astonished to understand that one person was willing to lay down his life so that his brothers, his co-workers, his buddies, the people that he went to war with for the previous years, was willing to put his life down for the rest 
of those people. And that sacrifice had a tremendous impact on how those soldiers started to treat each other. <clears throat> instead of going like dogs, and, and instead of treating each other like dogs, and cruelly and inhumanely, they started to treat each other more civilly. As people who loved one another, as people who would be willing to lay down their lives for each other. That's a, one of many, many stories that I could tell you of how love works and how love motivates and what genu genuine, true love does. Not the kind of love that, that you sometimes hear about on Mother's Day. You know, happy Mother's Day today, and I, I'm happy for all the mothers out there, but sometimes you know what happens on Mother's Day? You, you, you think, well, it's Mother's Day, so I guess I'd better go to the store and find a card because I'd better produce a nice card for Mother's Day, something that I looks like I, I spent a lot of time doing. And some people might have the thought in their minds, well, it's Mother's Day, I suppose I have to spend some time with my mother today. And I've got a million other things to do, but I suppose I should stop over there for a little bit. But, but she's going to go on and on and on about this, and, and, and might even get to the point where you hear the stories of, of how mom carried you for nine long months, and she spent 18 hours of probably the most intense pain that she has ever had to get you out into this world, and she cooked and cleaned and bathed and cared for you for all these years, and you don't even have time to stop over for a little bit. That's not love. We're tempted to do that, but that's not love. In, in our scripture readings for this morning, Jesus gives us a picture of what true love is. Genuine, sincere love. Not motivated by guilt, or, or shame, or, or I have to do this, but motivated by this is what I have seen in my life. And this is now what's going to motivate me in my life to show genuine, sincere love towards others. This sincere love motivates people to show the same kind of love that Jesus Christ showed us, which is gracious love. It's an 100% undeserved love. It's also a love that <clears throat> will not just stay with the recipients, but it will be reflected in their lives. <coughs> Last week, if you were here, you remember that we focused on the first eight verses of John chapter 15. And the one word that comes back over and over in those eight verses is the word remain. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Remain in my love and my love will remain in you. These verses, these next nine verses from verses 9 through 17, Jesus talks about now the motivation for what we said earlier to remain in my love. My love for you. This is Jesus' love. Not that we loved, but that he loved us first. It's not that way growing up, is it? When a person grows up in, in, in a typical family, <clears throat> aren't most things kind of gotten and gained by, by what you do and how you do and, and, and how you live? In other words, you learn very easy that Sometimes you have to resort to bribery to get your child to do what you want your child to do, right? Sometimes two years old, if you're good in the store for a half an hour in Walmart, maybe we'll get some ice cream. And you think that maybe that will motivate the child to be good for a half an hour and then you'll bribe them and give them their reward. If, if you get good grades, then what happens? Then you might get this or the other thing. I remember in, in, in grade school seeing some other parents who gave their, their, their kids money for every A that they got or every B they got on a kind of a declining scale. I always wished that I would get paid for my grades. But, but people have picked up on that in these days, haven't they? Do they still offer good grade insurance decreases? for those parents who have kids that can drive. When, when I was growing up, my parents always made sure that, you know what, we pay this much if your grades are this, but we pay this much if your grades are this, and that was my motivation to keep the grades up. Same thing with other businesses. 
sales positions. You, you, you reach a certain threshold and you get a bonus. You re reach another threshold and you get a, a trip. You, you get based on what you do. You receive based on what you do. And now the one thing that all those things have in common is that they are based on what you earn. And, and, and these are privileged based on what you have done, how you have deserved them or not. But you know very well that that's not the way that it works in God's kingdom. Over and over we hear the word grace, which is by very its de very definition an undeserved love, an unearned love. That's why we call it amazing grace. Because it's not the kind of grace that you normally think of in the world that we live in. When we are born into this world, we have zero privileges because we're born in sin. And we show that in our own lives. The only thing that we deserve from God when we are born is to be punished for the wages of sin. And, and we know what the wages of sin is. They're death. The wages, the payment that we truly deserve for our sins is death and hell. We don't have any bill of rights when we are born. We don't have any civil liberties that God guarantees to us just because we are born into this world. The only thing that God deserves to give us is punishment. Now I'll go back to the context of these words. If you remember last week, these words were spoken by Jesus to his disciples after the Lord's Supper and as they were going into the Garden of Gethsemane. 24 hours, less than 24 hours before Jesus was going to go to that cross. And basically Jesus was saying goodbye to his 12 followers. He was saying, this is how I have loved you. This is how I have cared for you. He, this is how I have served you. And he did that by, by washing his disciples' feet, by teaching his disciples a little bit. And then he put that kind of love into action the next day as he stumbled all the way up to the hill on Calvary. And as he was hoisted up on that cross, he showed that love, he continued to show that love as his breath stopped coming, as the heart stopped beating, because the blood was spent on paying for our sins. We don't deserve that. Did we deserve what Jesus did on the cross? No. But it's grace. Jesus gives it to us despite what we deserve. Go, go through the verses of our text and you'll see how privileged we really are as friends of Jesus or as, as children of God. We are privileged to be loved by God. We are privileged that God would keep us in his love. We are privileged to have complete joy. Privileged to be called Jesus' friends a couple of times. Privileged to pray in Jesus' name and have God answer our prayers. And then privileged to love one another. And that's what Jesus spends the remaining balance of the text talking about. This is my command. This is what I want you to do. This is how, I will, this is how you will show my love for you that is kind of getting in there. You will show that kind of love for one another. When we experience God's love, that love is reflected in everything that we do. Over and over, this is my command. Love one another. If, if the Bible is not about love, what is it about? It's not about laws. It's not about this is what you have to do. It's what God did for us because we couldn't keep the laws. So we just love each other. We reflect God's love. But it's not as easy as it sounds, is it? It's a little bit more difficult than just, well, I'm going to love the way that Jesus has loved me. We say, well, I can love some people sometimes, especially when they deserve it, but I can't love this person all the time in the way that Jesus demands it. <coughs> and, and we even excuse our actions by saying, Pastor, if you knew this person to whom you are telling me that Jesus says, you should show your love to that person, if you knew that person, you would not be saying that to me because then you would know better. If you knew the conversation that this person had with me, if you knew what this person did to me or said to me 17 years ago, you would not be expecting me to show love for this particular person. You wouldn't be expecting me to take his words or her words in the kindest possible way if you knew the words that he spoke. 
Jesus tells us simply, love each other as I have loved you. And then we decide that we're going to change the rules. I will love the way that I will love. When I decide to love. And how I decide to love. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, love as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? He loved us even, as Paul says, when we were still sinners and enemies of God. Shaking our fists at God, yet Jesus showed his love towards us. That's how we show that we are God's children, when we show love towards other people. This is when we become doers of God's word rather than just hearers of God's word only. This is the test of our love for Christ to obey what he commands, and he commands us to love each other, everybody. So, how does that look like in real life? In reality? Every day of my life? Do you need examples? I don't think that you really need examples, but, but here's a couple of less than concrete examples. Love cares and it shares, and it forgives, and it really does forget <coughs> as much as the human mind is able to forget other things. Love will not care about what a person looks like or what color the skin is. It just loves because Jesus didn't care about the skin color or the things that we had done. Jesus said just love. Love opens wallets when we see that other people have not known the gospel because they've never heard the gospel. So we hear a story about this mission opportunity opening up and so we'll open our wallets and we'll open our hearts and we'll open up our prayers and say, these people, even though I don't look like them and I don't act like them, I want them to know what I know. I want them to be in heaven where I'm going to be. Love does away with revenge and selfishness everything that we normally like doing. Love in husbands shows that every day is Mother's Day, not just one day on the calendar. Love for children shows that every day is Mother's Day and that the fourth commandment is still in play when it says honor your mother and your father and give them the respect that they deserve for what they have done for you. Children love their parents because God loved them. You know, it's been said that some people are just incapable of showing love, and, and usually psychologists will tell you that if that's the case, they really didn't experience any love growing up. And, and that is the case in some families, right? I, I, I hate to see it, I hate to hear about those kinds of things, and it, because it shudders you, shudders you to the core. Some people just don't experience love as they're growing up. We, we might think that we've been kind of shortchanged sometimes because my parents were not all that or all this, but some people really have not been that exposed to much love at all in their lives. And so as they grow up, what happens? They've never experienced it, so therefore, I don't know how to show it. They don't literally know how to act in certain situations. But if that's true, and it is true, then it shouldn't the opposite be true as well? If we have been shown love, if we have grown up with love, having been loved, then we should be able to know how to and put that kind of love into practice. Do you know that there has never been a day when you have not been loved by God? God showed his love chiefly when he sent his son down into this world. When nobody else would show us love, Jesus held up his hand and said, I will do that for them. And he went down into this world and he saved us. There has never been a greater love than when Jesus took that assignment and went to that cross and died on that cross and bled on that cross, went to the hell because of the sins that he was paying for on that cross. There's never been a greater love than that, and you and I have experienced it. We all know it. You've been around crosses. You've heard sermons on this kind of love. 
there has never been a moment when you have not been loved by someone. It might not have been all your family members or your, your parents, but you have been loved by God. In fact, it was when we were still sinners that God went to the cross for us. That's a fact. And if that's a fact, then Jesus says, remember that love. Obey my command, because my command is to love one another. Show that kind of undeserved love in everything that you do as you reflect that kind of love towards others. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, you, we did not choose you, but you chose us and appointed us to go and bear fruit in the world. Encourage us to ever-increasing fruits of faith and good works. Bless our neighbors through us, and when our last hour comes, receive us into your heavenly kingdom through the redemption that Jesus has won for us. All this we ask in his name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
The Lord be with you.